Today, we are going to talk about CRISPR screens. Uh, if you remember in the last lecture, we talked about, uh, first we talk about cancer therapy, targeted therapy, we talk about cancer immunotherapy. Despite all these development, um, only minority of patients respond to cancer immunotherapy. So it's a very big question, how we can improve immunotherapy response. And a major player of that is a technique called CRISPR screens. So um, let us explain what is CRISPR Cas9. So this is a system in the bacteria, uh, bacteria, and it's actually the adaptive immune system of the bacteria. And so we wonder, bacteria is a single cell mechanism. Uh, a single cell organism, if you think about human, right, we have adaptive immune systems. We have B cells, T cells, natural killer cells, macrophage, dendritic cell, neutrophil, so many different immune system. It's really um, many different functions to, in, uh, to have a immune response. But how does the bacteria as a single cell system have a immune system? Uh, it turns out it has one, uh, although it's kind of primitive. It works like this. Um, you probably have seen this in like high school biology. When there is a virus that infect a bacteria cell, the virus will leave the protein shell to the outside, but inject its DNA into the bacteria and utilize the bacteria transcription, DNA replication, protein packaging mechanism to make copies of itself. And then it will lyse the cell open and infect more cells. And so to the bacteria, this is kind of like a foreigner, an alien. But uh, some of the bacteria cell will die, but if the bacteria is able to survive this attack, it's gonna remember this bad guy. Say, supposedly it stave off this round of attack, and the bacteria will try to identify a unique piece of DNA sequence on the virus and insert it into a, a CRISPR array, kind of a, a genomic DNA sequence. It will try to keep a copy of this. And so um, scientists first discovered CRISPR-Cas9 because they saw there are these little repeat sequence in the genome. Uh, so there is something different than there's this sequence, uh, something different in the same sequence. It's like a, a, a um, there are these type of repeats and in the, this array format. Turns out this is kind of the file system for the bacteria to remember all the bad bacteria that is our, all the bad invaders before. So supposedly when this bacteria was young, it has seen this alien and that DNA sequence is inserted in here. And next time a new virus is like this, it invaded and this bacteria survived again, it's gonna insert a unique sequence into the, the one in front of it. And uh, third time there's an infection, another sequence, unique sequence is inserted to the front. And so um, the repeat in here, it's just a kind of a spacer in between the different signatures. Interestingly, the newest infection uh, that virus sequence is always added to the very front. And this is because this region of the sequence can be transcribed into RNA. And there are more copies made in the beginning than the end. And so the bacteria, you can imagine this is like a police station. It keeps track of all the bad guys that he has seen before. And in order to make sure um, it remember it well, it makes photocopies of them. And the newest the bad guy are always made into more photocopies, uh, which is RNA for this uh, foreign piece of DNA in here. And so that's the uh, CRISPR part is this the photo. And the, the Cas is uh, a protein. And you can imagine this as the bacteria policeman. And uh, every day it will report to the police officer to say um, reporting for duty and the station chief will say take a photo of the bad guy and patrol the field and so one police will take a photo of this guy another photo will take a photo of this guy another police will take a photo of this guy and because there are more uh, this type of photos available 
uh, because you make more RNA for this, there will be more police carrying the newest virus or the newer virus uh, patrolling around the field. And so um, this police will just patrol the, the cell. And next time, if this virus comes to infect the cell again, it will try to insert the DNA into the, into the bacteria again. The Cas9 protein will look at the photo and you know, basically this is same sequence as the original DNA sequence. Uh, Cas will say, I have seen this before. This is a bad guy, or at least this photo will say, this is a bad guy, we've seen this before. And then the Cas protein, uh, based on once it aligns, it will try to cut the DNA into pieces. And then that virus will not get a chance the next time to do any harm to the bacteria. And that's why it's uh, a adaptive immunity. In order for Cas to recognize this piece of invading DNA, it must have seen it before and kept a copy of it before. And so um, we have a question for this team. Um, we know that the bacteria kept a copy of the viral DNA onto the, its own genome. And it's also making copies. The next time the virus comes here, Cas is going to use this photo to say, yes, there is a match. I'm going to cut the DNA into pieces. So the question is, would Cas also use this photo to cut the original bacteria DNA? You know, cuts its own host genome. Would that happen? Um, so uh, we can ask the students to type your answers onto the screen. Do you think it's going to cut the bacteria genome that stored the information of that foreign piece of DNA? The answer is no. This is because, um, so here is the Cas protein. This is the double-stranded DNA from the virus. And this is the guide RNA, which is the photo of that foreign piece. Um, and this sequence would have a perfect match to the viral DNA, except that um, this piece of uh, foreign DNA is followed by a sequence called a PAM. And in this case, uh, for the Cas9 is uh, NGG. So different bacteria will have a different Cas protein and the different Cas protein will recognize a different sequence. Um, and so when the original bacteria kept a copy of the of the foreign DNA. It actually keep a piece of DNA followed by NGG, but that NGG sequence is not made into this uh, CRISPR array. Therefore, the host genome only have this piece of DNA, but is not followed by NGG. So the Cas protein will only cut the viral DNA, but will not cut the bacterial DNA. So for example, this is the viral DNA. It has this unique piece of sequence from the virus followed by NG. GN means it's any amino acid uh, DNA sequence followed by NG, yeah, NGG. And then this Cas protein is going to use this RNA, which match perfectly to uh, the virus DNA. But then it doesn't have this NGG. And the bacterial genome also does not have the NGG. And once the Cas is here, it makes the, makes the cut two things might happen. Uh, the cell will know that there's, there are free ends of DNA being cut. It's going to try to repair this from using this um, double-stranded DNA break repair mechanism. And there are two mechanisms. One is uh, it will just try to join the ends together. It's called a non-homologous end joining. It's just try to stitch the two ends together. It's not a perfect joining. Sometimes there would be insertions and deletions um, during the joining. This is also why uh, in the previous lecture, we mentioned that in VBJ recombination, the cell is trying to stitch a V piece with the D and the D piece with the J. And when the three pieces are stitched together, it's using this type of non-homologous end joining. When you try to stitch the ends together, there are small insertions, deletions, and mutations happen at the joining location. Uh, this is one type of repair. The other type of repair is, um, so supposedly there is a cut and uh, there, you also provide a template DNA. This template DNA could be what's um, 
human provided or like artificially provided, but the cell originally had this homologous uh, recombination um, repair because you usually have two copies of the DNA. If one, one copy is cut, it can use the other copy as the homologous piece to try to repair this. And so it's trying to use a template to re repair the original damage. And so um, it, it will create, it will basically just do the repair, but use the other template DNA. And this is the HDR repair. And so both things can happen. Um, and so this was originally a bacterial system. And uh, recently scientists, uh, especially pioneers such as uh, Feng Zhang's lab at the Broad Institute, they thought, wow, this is a great idea to bring this into the human system for genome engineering. Because all you need is a protein Cas and a RNA, which is a CRISPR, it's like a photo. And you can pretty much target anywhere in the genome, right? You can basically use this photo to bring the cast to a particular location into the human genome. Um, as long as there is a PAM NGG sequence, you design, you know, 20 nucleotide sequence before that, uh, which is a perfect match, it will bring cast to this location and, and cast will cut the DNA. It's a double stranded cut. Right? And so with that cut, also two things will happen. Supposedly this location of the cut is on the axon of a gene and the cell is trying to stitch the two ends together in the process creating uh, insertion deletions or mutations. And this could essentially knock out the function of a gene. Uh, supposedly it creates a um, out of frame mutation. Uh, the, the cell is stitching the two ends together and the, the remaining RNA is out of frame. And so you pr produce some garbage uh, sequence there. And so that will create a gene knockout. Alternatively, if, if you make the cut, but you also provide a piece of DNA as a template, the cell will think that this is the other copies of DNA. You, you give it a lot of the template DNA and it's gonna try to use the template human provided in order to do the repair and in the process edit the original sequence. So supposedly this location of the cut has a mutation in human uh, which causes a rare disease. And uh, if you provide the template with the correct sequence, then a portion of the cells will repair with the template we create and correct the DNA sequence and essentially um, like correct the mutated genome. And this has now been used for uh, in the clinic to correct uh, rare mutations in genetic diseases. And you can even you know, think about crazier things like um, creating a dinosaur starting from lizard. If you start you know, doing a lot of different gene editings, you can basically create a new species. And um, Scientists are now trying to use this for genetic disease to create species with more desirable uh, genotype or uh, plants with good uh, drug resistance or, or um, parasites resistant phenotypes. And so this is how CRISPR really work in human now. Um, and computationally, uh, what we got really excited is this uh, new approach uh, called CRISPR screens. Um, so it's using CRISPR not to just knock out one gene, it's using CRISPR knockout in a high throughput fashion. So um, it works like this. Um, we can grow cells in millions, millions, and um, we infect the cell with a pool of the uh, CRISPR Cas. And every cell will take up one Cas that carries one photo, which is the CRISPR, and that will knock out one different gene. And so we could grow this pool of cell, each cell with a different gene knockout. And you can just grow the cell over time. Um, and you can imagine, depending on what gene is being knocked out, that cell might be growing faster or proliferate more. And uh, in the final pool, you might see a lot of the cells carrying the same type of gene knockout. You can see here is a positive selection. A lot of the final cells will carry this one 
guide RNA or photo, right? Um, this is similar to this situation. Originally, uh, the, say we have one gene, and in order to make sure we have good knockout, sometimes um, we create a multiple different guide RNA against the same gene. This is as if we want to knock out the gene Stalin to make sure that you correctly knock out the gene, we use different photos. So Cas9 will bring these different photos into the different cells and knock out the gene Stalin. And then at the very end, we look at the cells, we say, well, you know, how many cells still carry the Stalin photo? It turns out, ah, there's a lot of cells with the Stalin photo. There are also situations where if we knock out the gene, somehow these type of cells will grow slower or they will just die and they disappear from the pool after you grow it for two to three weeks. And at the end, um, the cells that have this particular photo is much more depleted. And this is called a negative selection. So this is another example. When we initially, you want to have even coverage. Um, We're only showing you two examples of two genes, but you can imagine in a CRISPR screen, we can target thousands of genes or tens of thousands gene, genome-wide, all the genes. And every gene, we use uh, different photos or different CRISPR guide RNA to target them. And so uh, say in this other situation, initially we have roughly same number of cells you know, carrying this photo uh, for the gene knockout, but then we grow the cell for two to three weeks and we look at it, there are only very few cells that still carry this photo. So the question for this group is, uh, can we guess the function of the gene targeted by the Stalin photo? Is the Stalin gene promoting cell growth or preventing cell growth? Can you guys enter your answers into the chat? Is the gene targeted by the Stalin photo promoting cell growth or inhibiting cell growth? Um, actually, the gene targeted by the Stalin photo is inhibiting cell growth. Because initially we have the same representation, but after we, the photo is going there to knock out the Stalin gene. Once this gene is knocked out, the cell is growing a lot. And so in the final pool, we see an overrepresentation of the cells carrying the Stalin gene photo, which means the Stalin gene is being knocked out. And so when a gene is positively selected, this gene normally inhibit cell growth. But in contrast, in this situation, the second case situation, the gene targeted by the, uh, this Washington photo is really important for cell growth. And if you use this CRISPR guide to knock out the gene, this the uh, Washington gene, the cell is not growing or it's dying. And so in the final pool, you have fewer representation of cells that still have this gene knockout. And so it means that Washington gene is essential for cell growth or proliferation in the cell, whereas Stalin gene is preventing the cell from growing. Okay, so, um, so you, you wonder, uh, so, so this is how we use CRISPR screen to um, look at the gene functions to at least for cell growth. But uh, how do we even know this? You know, how do you know the photo situation? Um, so at the end, if you remember, we, we only design a guide RNA. This photo is about 20 nucleotide long. And so when we do this experiment, and this piece of DNA, remember, is uh, kind of unique um, in the genome. And so at the very end of the experiment, you just ask the cell, every cell, show me the photo you carry. And so every cell, you, you, you PCR amplify out their photo and you do high throughput sequencing. And just by counting how many photos you see in the beginning, because you try to make them even, but some, you know, some might have over-representation, others initially it may, may not be completely uniform. It could follow some kind of a normal distribution. 
Um, but then you also look at the photos at the very end, you count how many times it happens. And comparing the initial condition, we call this zero day. You just infect the cell with the CRISPR. They go into the cell, and this is the beginning of the experiment, you know, and then you compare with the photo counts in two to three weeks. And based on the count difference, we will be able to guess whether this target gene is helping the cell grow or preventing the cell grow. Okay, so that's how CRISPR screen works. Um, there are also CRISPR A or CRISPR I screens. So CRISPR knockout has the CRISPR sequence in, so you create this guide RNA sequence on the exons. So the Cas9 protein will go in there and really cut the DNA, uh, make a double strand, uh, the double strand break. But there are also, um, you can create a mutated version of Cas9, which only goes to the location, but does not do the cutting. And so this is called a D-Cas9 or like a mutated Cas9. It still uses a CRISPR guide to bring it to the location, but the D-Cas9 will only go there, but does not do the killing or the, the, does not do the double-stranded break. Um, instead, a scientist can engineer this D-Cas9 protein to be connected to a transcription activator, or sorry, in this case, it's a VP64 is a transcription activator, or CRAB is a transcriptional repressor. And usually this piece of CRISPR guide RNA is targeting the promoter regions of genes. And so you basically bring, use DCAS9, um, well, so you use the CRISPR guide the sequence to go to the promoter sequence to bring the DCAS9 to the promoter sequence, but depends on whether the DCAS9 is attached to uh, VP64 or CRAB, it will activate the expression of a gene or suppress the expression of another of, of a gene. Uh, these two experiments are separate experiments. You either use the CRISPR A um, for all the guide or use CRISPR uh, A for all the experiment. Um, but this basically, you can also do the same experiment as before, but rather than knocking out a gene and kind of you, you, you create a loss of function if, uh, effect, in this case, you can upregulate the expression or downregulate the expression of some genes, and you can still look at phenotypes. And this has also been quite widely used. Uh, recently, there is another type of CRISPR uh, experiment, which is called perturb-seq or crop-seq. This is CRISPR screens followed by single cell RNA-seq. Uh, so imagine you have a pool of different CRISPR. Um, usually here, you don't do genome-wide. So supposedly you start you know, with some genes you are interested. It could start from a CRISPR screen and you identify some hits, say 50 genes, maybe these are hits. And you wanna see out of these 50 genes, what is happening in the cell after you knock them out. And so you can imagine doing the CRISPR experiment, you know, one at a time, you, you grow the cell, you knock out one gene, you look at the differential expression, another cell, you knock out the gene, you do RNA-seq, you look at differential expression, but these are kind of expensive. So what you can do is you create a small library targeting those 50 genes and you infect all the cells together, you select those cells that have the you know, CRISPR gene knockout and you mix them together and you do a single cell RNA-seq. Uh, the single cell RNA seq not only have the read from the, uh, the that particular cell, but also have reads from the original guide RNA sequence. So you know in which cell what is the gene that's being knocked out, and then you can analyze all the different fifty gene knockouts in one single cell experiment. It's really powerful, but the technique is still kind of tricky. So scientists are still trying to improve the robustness of this experiment, but it just kind of give you an idea what people are doing with CRISPR, not just for genome editing, but can use CRISPR in a high throughput setting. Okay. Uh, 